I think you noted react sometimes reactivity to the dogs. Um, yeah. So I took him for the daycare trial this week, which she said that he snapped at two other dogs, but he's been around a lot of dogs. And I've never seen that behavior. Yep. I mean, of course, that was a different situation. I was not there. Who knows? Sure. Um, I, if another dog kind of barks at him is more when he will go towards them. Okay. Um, highly distracted during walks, I would say. Very okay. excited when people come in the house. Um, definitely needs, I mean, the jumping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, recall is not great. Okay. Because um, he's gotten out of the gate. You yell his name. Doesn't care. Okay. Because um, you're out in the suburbs, correct? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I have a fenced-in yard, but like if the gate's open, he's out of there. He's out, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or like front door even. Okay. I mean, no. Um. So I mean, I feel like it's just a lot of the basics. Okay. That he knows his basic commands, which is great. Um, you know, his sit, his stay, his come, but I feel like in like the bigger environments that he's just not like this. Yeah. 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 Um, the daycare, uh, was this on the first day that they noticed this behavior, or was this like after a couple of days? It was like a temperament test. I gave them like an hour, and then they called me and made me pick a box, and I was like... I see. Okay. I gotcha. All right. And now I hate them. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's funny. I'm like, he's never going anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anything else? Um, anything else? Are you sure it'll come to me? I'm okay. Um... So the daycare stuff, um, I, I always tell people to take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. Because, um, so at my facility, when we do the evaluations, it's over the course of three days. Okay. Okay. So the first day, the dog doesn't interact with any dogs. They interact with the, the staff. Okay. Uh, we walk them around the facility. We expose them to the other dogs, like just through like like this coexistence. Yeah. And then the second day, uh, we, we build off of that. And then, like, we might walk the dog closer to other dogs or other dogs around him, see how he feels. Yeah. Uh, by the third day, uh, we start the, like, uh, sniffing stuff, and it's very controlled. Yeah. So we have a... better. I'm sure if anything did happen, he was overwhelmed and overstimulated. Yes. He had not been exposed to it, and he's around other dogs all the time. Um, my parents have a dog, and dog that come over to my house, he's fine. Yes, because typically, like you noted, you weren't there. Right. So when the dog is stressed. in complete, yes, stress, okay? So a lot of times when these daycares take in dogs for the first day, they might assume like, oh, golden retriever, like they're social, right? Yeah. And they just throw them in and they can go south just because the dog is freaked out. Right. So because of that stress, and then you put them with 20 dogs, yeah. it just oh, yeah. escalates. It just yeah, yeah. He's still you know, pretty young. Yeah, I see he's got a little bit of prey drive, it looks like. Oh, I saw that squirrel yeah. there. I mean, yeah, scooter, <laughs> bike. World. Gotcha. You name it. Um, too. Yeah, so the daycare stuff for me, not out the ordinary. Also, just because of your personal experience, like he's around dogs all the time. So. Yeah, yeah, it just it yeah. seemed out of character. But, but I, I wouldn't think that they did anything wrong, just more so their approach is incorrect, and that that's where that came from. Um, in regards to the other stuff, it's really straightforward. It's pretty simple. Um, I'm assuming before reaching out and booking this, you did some research on how we train and the methods yeah, that we so, use. Yeah, um, so my friends, Zach and Dana Schmidt, okay. have both used oh, yeah. at your facility. Yep. Um, so recommended you yep. um, for training. So yeah, he's new to my life, but he came to me at eight months old. Okay. Um, and so we've done like command training and stuff. It's still a lot of that with us getting to know each other. Right. Um, but yeah, a lot of the obedience stuff is just, it's, it's so time consuming for people and so yeah I, so you, I acknowledge that i'm probably not putting in the time and effort that i should mm -hmm. um i try but it's hard too yes so the, the reason why it's hard in my opinion is that a lot of the more popular methods either require a bit of technical skill yeah and or the methods don't really work once you're out into this real world they don't translate well uh so if you're doing like food positive based training uh if like that squirrel for example is more rewarding than the food, even if it's chicken or you know steak, yeah. he's gonna opt for that instead. Okay, and that's just animal behavior. Now, your tool here, the prong collar, is a better tool because you have what we call pressure. Now, this particular model of prong uh, is the least effective for a couple of reasons. One, the tabs on the prong collar really take away what the prong collar is supposed to do. Okay, the, the little black tabs. And then uh, the black strap here, if you were to feel an actual prong collar with the chain, it's much more smoother. Okay. Uh, and the collar looks to be fitted incorrectly as well. It should be a little bit smaller. Okay. Because okay? it should stay high up on his neck here, which gives you the most control. 
when it's down here, you can see how he can put, he's putting his chest like this into it, right? That's where the base of his power is. So that's how dogs typically pull humans down because he has more leverage being lower to the ground and your center of gravity is here that we get this effect, right? And that gives us the least amount of control. So again, if you don't have technical skill, you can put it up here and then two minutes later, it's back down here again. So that's where technical skill comes into play because uh, you're knowing how to use the tool correctly that gives you the most control, yeah. okay? Now, the issue with prong collar is that some dogs will bypass the prong, even if you correct them firmly, mm -hmm. because they have fur, because they're meant to bite each other, they have a higher tolerance for pain and discomfort. Yeah. Um, I've had clients like Jesse, I'll, I'll gank the, the, the chain or whatever, and the dog's just like completely in phase. I'm like, right, because you have a limitation in terms of strength, ability, uh, uh, technical skill, all that stuff, right? that the dog goes, yeah, I, I, I can handle more than that. Plus the fur acts as a buffer, so it, is, so it takes away some of that. So um, that's why we do remote collar training, which Bogey is trained on, yeah. he's on the e-collar. Yeah, I have one, but I don't really know how to use it, so I haven't been comfortable training him with it, because uh, you want to do it wrong. Um, but I have, I guess, a picture of it. Yeah, let me see the, do you know how long ago you bought it? Um, my brother gave it to me. My brother has a Doberman who he's doing e collar training with. Okay. He lives in California. It's I got gotcha. you. Okay, mini educator. Um, I got gotcha. you. And so he's kind of given me like some tips and stuff, but again, I still just like was, didn't feel comfortable using it. I knew what I was doing with it to use it on him because I didn't want to give him. He's like incorrect. 40, 45 pounds, maybe a little bit more. I would say 50. 50? Plus. Okay. 52 was probably his last that visit, maybe 55. Ish. Okay. So the collar that he gave you, just as FYI, is meant for a 35 pound dog and under. Okay. Okay. Um, that's why it's called Mini Educator. Yeah. So there's different tiers in terms of the collars. You have like in that particular brand, a Mini Educator, Educator, and then the Boss. Mm -hmm. Think of them as small, medium, large, low, medium, high, in terms of output. And the reason why it's important is every dog's uh, tolerance is different. Every dog's um, uh, behavioral issue is different. We have to factor in things like stress. Does the dog have a long coat? Like the like Bogey, he's got a, he's a big dog with a thicker coat. He's actually on the high powered collar, okay? Uh, because of all those factors, right? So I'm not against the educator, but um, it is a good brand because other collars have like five levels, which, which your educator has a hundred. Okay, so five and a hundred are the same, but you have 95 more divisions. Okay, so it allows us to really fine tune it. So that's great. That's really what I care about the most. The issue that I have with the educator is that one, you have one meant for a smaller dog, yeah. but then two, um, when I first started training like 12 years ago, I used to train using that brand because I could, as a seller, order one. They would overnight it to me so I could have it for the client. Yeah. Whereas the brand that I use now, Doctra, I had to buy like $3,000 worth of inventory up front and I didn't have three grand. I was a poor guy starting his business. So. But then what, I, what happened was I had issues. I had a lot of issues with the dogs that I was training. And that particular uh, time, I had a lot of reactivity cases and they were all getting worse. Okay. So then I was like, well, let me try the dog tra. And then they all made progress, sure. okay? My uh, theory is because the stim is delivered differently, it's a sharper sensation right. than the dog tra. The dog tra is duller, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, that's my theory. It's the only thing I could, um, uh, how would you say? Uh, decide that was like a defining factor and then since then I've just used dogs and not look back look back um, it's the best training tool in my opinion so you're welcome to start with the tool that you have yeah but if we're having any issues I would say you're gonna want to invest in, a, in the appropriate collar and I'll let you know which one but then we may have lost like a class or two because we we're trying to use the mini educator so that's just a heads up on that okay, okay? so but it is a good brand of collar um, questions on any of that stuff so do you have any idea what an e-collar is? I mean, I've done a lot of like research and watched a lot of videos on it mm -hmm. more about using it as a means of like communicating with him mm -hmm. rather than a means of discipline. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I just haven't, still haven't done enough or I haven't learned enough that I felt really comfortable actually. Do you know what the sensation is? Yeah. What is it? It's almost like, like a tingling. I felt it on my hand. You felt it, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so have you ever had- um, Vibrate and like the tingling. Uh, the, the, a TENS unit? Yeah. Yeah. The stim therapy. Yeah. yeah it's an e-collar. Okay. It's just a muscle stimulator. Yeah. So if you felt yours like at a 10 to 15, it yeah. might've felt like a tingling, especially if you're using continuous, the higher you go, then you'll start to see where the, the, the e-collar will start moving your muscles. Okay. So if I put the e-collar here, 
a lot of times my thumb will twitch yeah. because it's moving this uh, muscle here that moves my thumb in response, okay? So it's just a muscle stimulator. Uh, just because a lot of people think that it's like a shock or like electricity, you know, like yeah, electrocution. Yeah. Uh, so I always want to clarify with people, it's like, it's, it's electric, but not electricity. It's right. usually how I describe it. Uh, they use a technology in humans all the time. Uh, you're correct. I want the dog to understand his line of communication, yeah. but it's also discipline is fine. I think the biggest issue is people think of it as a punisher. And the, di the difference between uh, that is that most people will put the e-collar on the dog. They go out. Let's say the dog starts to bark at other dogs and they'll just like have it maxed out because yeah. they're like, I'm going to punish you so bad that you're just never going to do that again. Right. But the problem is the dog doesn't understand why it's happening. The dog has to understand the communication. Uh, so that this way, if I do have to use a higher level to stop the behavior, the dog goes, OK, that happened because I did this. And if I stop doing that, the thing I don't like goes away. Mm -hmm. We want the dog to understand how it turns on and how it turns off. That's always the, the key um, factor to training is if the dog doesn't understand the collar, it'll make things worse. Right. Okay. So like, for example, I had a client, they live like, they live like two blocks down. They did a two week board and train at a, another training facility, uh, like a year or so ago. And anytime they put the collar on, the dog is always shaking and salivating. Okay. So a year later, so I, they show up, we have the consultation here. I see the dog and I go, your dog doesn't understand the e-collar or it wasn't trained correctly. And they ask, like, well, how do I know? And I said, because after a year of exposure, post the training, your dog is still freaked out about the collar. Your dog should not be freaked out about the collar now. Okay, it's been plenty of time. So then um, they signed up, they did a really short program, they did like three classes with me. I had the first class and the first class is always heel. Okay, which is walking on a leash. Okay, the reason is leash pulling is one of the most common things that people want to correct, and leash reactivity is one of the most common things people want to address. Okay, so heel addresses both of those things. Okay, so it's always the first thing that we do. Plus, it's a great way to teach e collar. So they showed up, we did the e the healing stuff, and then I said, go practice this for two weeks. Okay, and then and then I was like, come back after then. So then fast forward two weeks, you know, we met over where it splits off right there. He had the e-collar on. He was sitting there nice and calm, ears back, no longer shaking, no longer salivating. And they go, Jesse, this is crazy. And I go, yes, because now your dog understands the tool. It, it was layered as a punisher. So for the dog, it was seemingly random yeah. when it would turn on because, it, because they were using it like that. They're like, oh, I said, sit, you didn't do it. I punish you. Okay. As opposed to layering it in to teach the dog, when you feel this, there's a way to turn it on and a way to turn it off. Okay. So now that he understood... He had plenty of exposure because it had been a year of them using the tool post the training. He just never understood it. Yeah. So then once he understood it, he's like, oh, okay, cool. I'm great. I'm relaxed now. Does that make sense? Yeah. So um, even as humans, like let's say you go outside and you find a ticket. You have a car? Yeah. You find a ticket on your car. You look at the ticket and there's no reason. Okay. And the next day you wake up and you find a ticket on your car. You look, there's no reason. Yeah. Okay. You, you're going to start to get pissed off or frustrated because you're like, how do I avoid this ticket? Right? because you don't understand how to avoid the consequence. So it's the same thing for the dog. If they don't understand how to avoid the consequence, they start to get frustrated, start to get freaked out, okay? So the first thing we always teach is the heel for a number of reasons, uh, aside from the ones I just noted. One, most people in the city walk their dogs three times a day, seven days a week. So that's three times a day, seven days a week that we get to expose the dog and practice this line of communication. Uh, E-collar is a stressor, okay? Um, so once the dog starts going to stress, some dogs in the beginning will be more anxious, nervous, or fearful in response to the stress. The e collar is not making them worse. That's just how they are. But then through repetition, the dog goes, oh, okay, this isn't so bad. I know what this is now. Okay. So it's like an EMT on the first day, they see a lot of crazy stuff. They're going to be under stress, right? But then over time, they get desensitized to it. And they're like, oh, yeah, it's just the day in the office. Then. Oh, yeah. My... Uh, so I used to uh, bartend on a couple of boats off of Burnham Harbor yes. and the captain's son, um, uh, is, he's now a PA, but I think he did um, like a, res a residency, is that yeah, what it's called? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like the first day he had to drill into like someone's knee or something like that. Like it was great. I'm like, what? I was like, that's insane. Yeah, and he was ICU for a couple of years. So. Yeah. So I was like, to me, I'm like, that's, I would be stressed out. And he's like, oh, he loves it. Like he's yeah. just built for that kind of yeah. stuff, you know? So for the dogs, it's the same thing. They go under stress, right. right? And then we continue to repeat that process. And eventually the dog goes, oh, okay. Like I know what's going on. I understand the communication, but also in my opinion, it toughens them up, okay? okay? In, a, in a positive way. So dogs, when uh, with their puppies, if there's a weak puppy, 
they will poke and prod the puppy, nip at them and stuff to toughen them up because they're thinking at some point you have to be self-sustaining, right? They don't understand that at two months they're going to get adopted out to a family and they're not going to really have to go hunting and all that stuff. Right. It's all instinctual, right? So they use physicality to toughen up the puppy to get it ready for the real world. So a remote collar, uh, because it's physical, it's that contraction, when done correctly, in my opinion, it toughens up dogs. Okay. So the dog goes, okay, uh, like if they're stressed out because of this environment being more busy, um, the e-collar, because it's a stressor, they're able, they, they learn to tolerate it, but then they learn how to handle the stress of the e-collar, that stuff like this becomes easier. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's hard for people to understand, like how does this thing that's bad, right, that a human deems bad or like is hurtful, whatever, can actually help them. And I go, it's because the way dogs interpret it is different than the way humans interpret it. Yeah. You know, so I was raised old school, I was spanked. Um, so for me, I find it like, that's why I'm so disciplined, you know? Um, but the intention wasn't to hurt me. The intention was to teach me a lesson of like, you don't want to do that again. Yeah. Right. Dogs are the same way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Question on any of that. No, I don't think so. Um, so for what you're wanting to achieve with Toby, right? Um, like what are your goals? Um, I mean, in general, obedience, I definitely want much better um, leash, like interaction with them, less distracted on walks, I'd like to be able to focus and heal, which she doesn't really do, and the mm -hmm. pulling is bad. Um, minimize some of the chaos when, like, someone's at my front door. Okay. <laughs> um, what else? And recall. Recall's a huge one. Okay. So if he is off leash and is away from me, I want to come back to him. Do you take him to like the off leash parks out in the burbs? Um, he hasn't really been yet because his recall, I'm just not confident. Because of that. I got gotcha. you. Um, he's been to the dog beach a couple times, but even then, like if one dog comes to play with him, they're fine, but then they keep walking mm -hmm. and he spots a dog, you know, down and he's like, oh, that dog played with me. He's gone. And I have to go running. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Um, so yeah, I literally want to like yell at him. <laughs> okay, and then are you looking? Because you're, uh, since you're coming from the from from out the city, um, for in person or like a board and train type option? Um, I'm open to either. I like. I mean, what do you recommend? Okay, so I'll there? break them down okay. in terms of pros and cons. Yeah, you're, and then also cost is a consideration. Yes, yes, yes. Of course. Um, but and I realized too that like I obviously need to be as well to mm -hmm. work with him. Correct. Um, so almost a combination, I would assume. Regardless of which program you choose, there's always in-person follow-up. Okay. Okay. Because that's a lot. That, that's super important. Because people drop off their dog one way and they pick it up another way. Yeah. But it's what's in between that's super important because that's what helps you, yes, exactly, yeah. keep that going forward. Yeah. Okay. So the pro of an in-person is you learn a ton more. Yeah. Because you show up with your dog, you have your tools, uh, we train here because this is the most uh, 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 busy park in Chicago, in yeah. case you didn't know. There was a, one of my clients, uh, her daughter uh, worked for the city, and her job was to do studies of all the Chicago parks to see how much they were being used. Okay, This is the busiest. Okay, so And this isn't even as busy as Oz Park gets. This is maybe like 40 to 50 percent. Yes, it gets crazy busy here. Okay, So we're in the middle of all this stuff, and we're training your dog. So we're not in a closed off environment. And even if we were, the way that I train, it still carries over. It's just that the human likes to have the experience in the actual context of, because it helps them carry it much more easily to their actual uh, neighborhood, okay? So uh, I don't need to touch your dog. You show up with your tools. Uh, I walk you through everything, okay? okay? So it's all hands-on for you. Yeah. And then I go, this is your homework, rinse and repeat, okay? You come back the next week. We do a little bit of feedback. You, uh, you know, hey, Jesse, he was doing really well here. We had some difficulty here, blah, 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 blah. I don't know, okay, sounds normal. We're gonna make some, we're gonna work on the second half of heel because heel is a two-part exercise. And then uh, make some tweaks and then go off and rinse and repeat for a week, okay? And then you come back, how are we doing? Oh, every, like 90%, 95% better, whatever. I go, great. Again, make some little tweaks. And then typically I like to jump into recall by the third class, okay? okay? So heel helps fix the most common problems, leash pulling and leash reactivity, recall, is one of the most important things that your dog can learn yeah. okay so and it takes the longest to teach uh, i have a client uh, i trained her first dog she came back i trained her second dog and then she told me 
uh, that her first dog took her six months before she felt that she was off leash reliable. So that just gives you a concept, okay? So I like to get it in as soon as I can in the training so you can begin that process, okay? So I've heard that boxers are notoriously poor with recall in general. Doesn't matter. Okay. Doesn't matter, yeah. So like breed should not matter with, okay. Mm -hmm. Anything that's breed related, the only way it would matter in the, is in the sense of, do we have the appropriate collar for the dog? Okay, okay so I wouldn't put a mini, mini educator on a Rottweiler. Believe it or not, I did have a client with like a hundred pound pit who was on the mini educator and the dog, he, like he couldn't stop the reactivity. And I go, uh, one, the dog didn't know how to turn it off. But then two, I was like, this is meant for like a dog quarter, a third of your dog size. So we had to change all those things and then we were able to fix it. Okay. Uh, but yeah, breed does not matter with the training. Okay, right. what does matter is you. Okay. Yeah. Do you do the homework? Do you follow my instructions? Yeah. So the biggest thing that we struggle with really is if I have a dog with a high tolerance, let's say, uh, so uh, your color was 100, for example. Let's say Toby's number ends up being 80 out of 100, okay? okay. You as the human go, wow, I'm, you know, four fifths of the power. Yeah. Like, I, like, am I hurting my dog? Like, am I, am I an evil person, right? You start to feel all these emotions and then it deters you from applying the collar the way it needs to be, okay? I don't. If Toby needs 80, I'm at 80. Okay, and that's why I get results because I'm going to where the, what the dog needs and not what the human is comfortable with. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I had a case, a uh, dog was 20 pounds, um, super reactive. Like here, a dog could be 100 feet away, barking, barking. crazy, okay? He's tired today, so this is better. <laughs> this is calm, Toby. He's behaving, yeah. <laughs> um, so I told her, because I recognized the intensity of the reactivity, I said, you want the high power collar, the same one the bogey has, okay? okay? And then by the, it took me to the fifth class to we finally resolve the reactivity because it was it was that bad. Yeah. So people look at the small dog and they go like, "You're a small dog. You don't need, you know, anything more than a mini educator." But in that uh, equivalent, it would actually be the boss that the dog would have needed. Okay. And her video is actually up on my Instagram and YouTube. Yeah. It's a one minute clip, and you see her flipping out, yeah. and then you see her being nice and calm. Okay. And I'm I have to do a longer, more in depth one. And I know yours is primarily obedience. But that's why I get the results because yeah. the I was willing to go there and the owner was willing to go there consistently. Yeah. Okay. So she literally had to max out the collar and we walked around the park 127 every single time she blew up at the dog. And eventually by the second half of the walk, the dog stopped. And I go rinse and repeat for two weeks now because I want to make sure that this is, is, is sinking in. Yeah. And then she booked and then we were good to go. Okay. So that's always the, the, the biggest factor is the human. I do get people that go like, Jesse, I don't want to go above 40. I'm like, I understand that, but your dog isn't giving you what you're looking for. <laughs> and that's why we're not getting there. I'm willing to. And it's all, there's a method to it. We don't just go there. Right. So that's why it took so long for that one case, because I had to try everything else first. And then I go, okay, here it is. This is, gonna, this is what we're going to do. Because then as the human, you have to see the process. So if we end up in these crazy levels, you go, well, yeah, we did everything else and it wasn't working. But then as soon as we went here, I started to see progress yeah. and then that helps kind of just validate the human. Okay. Uh, so yeah. So with the in-person pro is you learn a ton of stuff. Mm -hmm. Con is it just takes longer. Right. Okay. So I mentioned earlier that, you know, that one client took six months before she felt her dog was reliable. Even if you did a board and train, we still have a cap. We only have a short window of time right. to work with your dog uh, and we can get a lot done. So I, I always tell people that think of um, three weeks of your time is one week of our time. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because we're a training facility, I have multiple handlers and trainers that can work the dog throughout the day. Uh, we do teach everything within one week, sit, stay, down, come, place, heal. It's really how far do we get the dog, okay? So the pro of a board and train is we do all the work for you. We get everything done within a short period of time, okay? Um, the con is we still have to do transference. We still have to teach you everything. We still have to bridge that gap, okay? And you still have homework on your end it's just your dog's capacity for uh, obedience is much greater and you're just kind of catching up to the training. And like success rate wise for both, would you call it equal? The dog is never the problem. Okay. Yeah, the dog's never the problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's always a human. Yeah. The other con to the board and train is like, let's say Toby ends up being one of those rare cases where his number's just up there. Yeah. Now, um, uh, it's just because I'm like, oh yeah, your dog's number is 90 and you're like, really? <laughs> you know? is um so we film everything now yeah right so like if you did a board and train i filmed the first lesson of every new thing that we teach okay okay so the first lesson on heel uh the follow-up lesson on heel sit down everything 
okay? So if he freaks out, if he goes under stress or whatever, you see it happen in real time, okay? Right. And you see me working through it real time, okay? So then you go, oh, like, yeah, Toby did all this, but Jesse was calm. He continued on, and by the end, he was doing well. And then towards the, because it's going to be a series of videos, because they're not all done on, on in one take, is you see just the dog's progression over each new thing, because now the dog is understanding, right? But it helps you close the gap. Does that, under, does that make sense? Yeah. It helps you close the gap of like, okay, and also learning how to f fix a problem should a problem come up. So like I deal with a lot of reactivity cases. Mm -hmm. My specialty uh, in niche and dog training is aggression and reactivity. Okay. So if a person, like for example, uh, the dog's name is Georgia, when Georgia became reactive, mm -hmm. I talked the owner through it. Okay. So she was just doing everything as I instructed her, right? In a board and train video, if we were able to recreate that, it would be the same thing where I'm just, I'm, I'm displaying it. Um, so the owner goes, okay, this is what he did. Uh, but there's still just the the gap of the handler skill, remaining calm, yeah. you know, not getting stressed out or overwhelmed by the situation. So th those are like kind of the pros and cons of either approach. You have the option to do either because your dog is pretty much just obedience type stuff. Yeah. Okay, very minor behavioral stuff, the jumping, really minor uh, uh it's you know i want to call my dog walk my dog yeah. and you know just kind of be able to do stuff and have reliability yeah. okay if you had the only time i don't do board and trains is if it's human aggression no, because he um he likes them too much <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I, I always tell people like you want to know how to do this yeah. okay i was like i already know how to do it you want to know how to do it yeah. okay great with kids, yeah so, so for you awesome. you have either option uh board and trains also a little bit more expensive sure. um so we get more in a short amount of time, but it costs a little bit more money. Yeah. Um, uh, in person, a little bit cheaper. Okay. Yeah. Question on you that. No. How much is the board train? So I know I, I believe a two week, a one week is seventeen fifty. I believe a two week is twenty seven fifty, and I think each week after that you just add a grand. Okay. So three weeks three hundred seven fifty, four week forty seven fifty. Okay. okay. The in person. Yeah. Uh, and the, our rates are on our website. I think it's yeah. Not a, yeah, yeah. So I think the in person like, six week is like around fifteen hundred. Okay. And that's not including a caller if you need to upgrade it. And that's like once a week, every Saturday? Or... Uh, yeah, something like that. Okay. So what you do is you, you'd reach out, uh, you know, tell Tina, hey, Tina, sign me up. I want the six-week program or whatever. Um, and this is my availability. And I always tell people, give her windows. Yeah, Don't yeah. give her specific times because she's trying to, my, my schedule is just all over the place. So when she sees a window, she goes, okay, you're free on Saturdays at this time. Jesse's got a slot. I could put you here and that time for six weeks plus one so seven weeks technically is your recurring time okay, okay? so we'd meet here uh, unless there's like inclement weather like when it was pouring we have to like relocate to the facility a couple of times uh, i know for some clients because they don't drive or stuff they have to push back the only issue with that is um, my schedule is being booked ahead of time yeah so then if they keep trying to push back due to weather um, at some point they might lose their slot because now we've moved past their priority time we had to book somebody else. They don't lose their classes. They just may lose their time slot. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, uh, it's usually once a week. Now, for clients that want more from their training, the longer the program, the more we're building towards off-leash. Okay. okay. So, um, let's say you want like an off-leash recall, which no matter what program you do, aside from the three-week, we always build towards off-leash recall. If recall is not off-leash reliable, it's useless. Okay. So, uh, even with the six-week program, which is um, what I would probably put you at, at yeah. minimum, is I go, this is the exercise, right? You want to now go and practice, and eventually you will have the reliability of off-leash recall, yeah. okay? And there's stages, and I explain all that stuff. Um, if you do like a nine or 12-week program, it allows us to build other things to off-leash reliability as well, okay? So sit, stay, down, come, place, heel, what I call the six family pet commands, yeah. can all be built towards off-leash reliability, okay? okay? Most people don't, use those commands off leash. The most commonly uh, off leash used commands are recall yeah. and heal, yeah. okay? And maybe stay. But other than that, the rest are kind of superficial. It's more like I have a client that um, enjoys the process. You know, they, they, they enjoy having the idea of like, I have a completely off leash trained dog and that's why they do it. Yeah. Um, but it's, a, it's very rare that I get clients that go that long, okay? Uh, most people are happy with an off leash recall and an off leash heal. And then everything else is just for function, yeah. okay? So everything that we teach is meant for function. It's meant for use. So if you want to take Toby and go to a restaurant and have him laying at your feet and not like be like inquisitive or like saying hi to everybody, we can do that. Okay. okay? Uh, if you want to be able to approach the like 
like somebody coming to the door and him running. Like, so we have an exercise that we cover. There's two ways of approaching. One is technically place command. Are you familiar with place? Yeah. Okay. Now, if he's breaking place to charge the door, it's because there's no real formal consequence. Yeah. Okay. So once you have a consequence, the dog goes, that sucked. I don't want that. Now he has a motivator to keep him from charging the door to say hi. Yeah. Okay. The second approach is what I call a more behavioral approach is when he hears the knock and stuff, I'm assuming he gets like really worked up because he knows it's a human. Yeah, well, because the doorbell will ring sometimes for packages and I won't get it. Mm -hmm. But, like, if he sees me go to the door and obviously I'm talking to someone is when he's more like, I have to see this person mm -hmm. and greet them. Yeah. And he goes nuts. Yeah. Absolutely nuts. Yeah. So um, the problem and there... And I don't have, like, a second door, so, like, if I can't, I have to understand. You have to be there. To talk. It's, yeah. It's, it's very difficult. The uh, other option uh, with the behavioral approach is because the issue is the excitement. Yeah. The overstimulation. Yeah. Right? Is... If we don't really address that overstimulation, um, nothing is telling him to, uh, so like place command, for example. If he's on place, he can still be excited, mm -hmm. right? He's there, he's contained, yes. and he's still doing this because he's still anticipating, yeah. right? So it's possible that the dog's overstimulation will cause them to break the command mm -hmm. because it's worth um, the consequence, yeah. okay? When we do the behavioral approach, what we do is bring the dog from up here and calm them down to down over here. So now that he's passive, he's still gonna be happy and excited to see the guest. He's just not gonna be overwhelmingly yeah. happy or excited, okay? So uh, we do do in homes. The only issue is we'd have to see how far uh, you're located out yeah. the city. Uh, just because if I get caught- Being under construction, it doesn't help. Yeah, no, it, usually I was out in Niles. It usually is like 20 minutes, yeah. no, no, um, traffic took me an hour and 15 oh, yeah. yeah it yeah. was bad so yeah so we we have to see where you're located uh because there's an in-home upcharge yeah. if it's not that far we could put you at a time where like there's no traffic yeah. then it's then it's easy and it's just 50 bucks otherwise that's where things get more complicated because if i'm gone for an hour that way then i see you and then i'm back gone for another hour on the way back then it costs me time during the day what about like the jumping easy just in general too okay it's easy because if he like, so be, correcting behavior is simple because it's simply understanding how to correct behavior. Yeah. So like if he jumped on a dog, that dog may nip or bite him. Yeah. The dog's not aggressive. They're just saying, don't jump on me. Yeah. Okay. If he tried to mount the dog, they would nip or bite him. If he barked at the dog, they may nip or bite him. It's the same consequence for a behavior that they're not going to accept. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's the same thing for, for us. Once I teach you how to quote unquote discipline him, once he understands everything, it's literally the same approach. Where you're just saying, I don't want you to do that. Counter surfing, same approach. Jumping on people, same approach. Barking out the window, same approach. So once you understand it, it's simply just apply it. Okay. Okay. So like if I took cookies out the cookie jar, I got spanked. If I didn't do my homework, I got spanked. If I didn't do my chores, I got spanked. It was one consequence for a variety of behaviors. Yeah. So that's why behavior is technically more simple. Okay. With, with, with what you're dealing with. Uh, even aggression, it's literally the same thing. If the dog bites me, I have a special suit that I wear. I have the e-collar and I can bite them back and then teach them, you don't want to bite me because if you do, there'll be consequence. Yeah. So now the dog has to think of another way of handling the situation aside from aggression. Okay. I guess that just reminds me too, when he, so he, he gets walks probably like at least twice a day. Um, but when he, in the afternoon, like he's had a nap in the morning after a walk, his energy is peaking again and he wants to play, he'll bite my feet. Yeah. Or when we return from a walk and he's kind of got that like post walk energy, yep. he is kind of like barking at me and jumping towards me, wanting me to play with him. But that's not really behavior that I want to encourage like in that moment. Yep. I need to be able to walk from my gate to my house without him attack attacking me. Yeah. Uh, so that's another big one too, like just him knowing when it is appropriate to play and when it's not. So easy. Yeah. And the way that I teach, I always encourage people: you start the play, not your dog. Yeah. Yeah. Because he doesn't understand, like maybe you're if you got work, you got things to get done, yeah. right? He's a dog. Yeah. So I'm not opposed to people giving the dog affection. I'm not opposed to people playing with their dog. I am opposed to when they do it in response to their dog, because now the dog learns. I tell you right. when we do yeah. these so things. Yeah, so that's a big one too. Because I work from home and I work California hours. So like at one, three p.m. my time, it's only one p.m. at work for me. Mm -hmm. So he's peak energy and peak nuts, and my mm -hmm. meetings are just ramping up for the next four hours. Yeah. So that's a really big one. Sometimes just so you're aware the discipline behind the, the healing exercise resolves a lot of those problems. Okay. So there's, there's two ways of looking at it. One, 
uh, if he starts to get excited, right? Like, oh, this is time to play. You can actually correct that yeah. for one, okay? You can actually tell him, like bite him, quote unquote bite him. No, we're not playing right now. Okay. That's one way, okay? The second way is uh, with the structure of discipline and the healing exercise, making him focused, it's more uh, tiring for the dog because it's not physical exercise, it's mental. So my heel is very strict. I take five steps, he takes five steps. Yeah. I take three steps, he takes three steps. I stop, he automatically sits. This is with a completely slack leash and I don't care if the environment's super busy. Yeah. When you have that level of focus, it's much more exhausting for the dog because he has to block out everything else that he would want to do yeah. and pay attention solely to you. So a lot of times the healing exercise resolves a lot of these little minor behaviors because that to me sounds like frustration. He, he's, uh, he's getting overstimulated. Yeah. He wants to do something. Yeah. He's come in, he's like, hey mom, like they, they do something with me, right? And then if, even if you tell him no or put him away, you're still not resolving like the mental state of like, I want to do something. Right. Okay. And overstimulation is one of the most common things that dogs struggle with. Your dog has some overstimulation, but not overwhelming. Okay. Yeah. Cause you know how you laid down earlier, Yeah. right? He calmed down and then now he's back up and now he's doing this, right? This is him like needing to do something. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, in general, he's pretty good. I would say he's not a bad dog. He just needs training. <laughs> yeah, no, this is super common stuff. Yeah. But if you were to start, like once you start and move forward, it's going to be night and day. Yeah. Okay, once you have formal structure, it's like night and day. Okay, um, other, yeah, but other, otherwise you do have a good dog. It's just like simple things like that. Right. Uh, other questions? Um, I don't think so. Want to start? <laughs> uh, so for you, I would say at minimum six classes if you're looking to do the in-person. Okay? okay, and Tina will follow up with you with all this stuff too, okay? Uh, in the six classes, I would expect the layout to be two classes on heel. Those are always the first two. Okay. Third class is on recall. Fourth class is on place, which is stationary control. It can also help address your people coming over issue. Okay. Classes five and six, I would look at as a variable. Okay. okay. So like, let's say come class five, you're like, hey, Jesse, everything's going great, but I'm really still having problems with people coming over. Then I, we would look and see if we can book an in-home for that. Okay. okay. Then the sixth class comes with the variable. And then a lot of times people use the sixth class to learn how to build heel and recall to like a, to like an off leash level. Yeah. So I give you exercises and then I just go rinse and repeat for the next few months. And cause people then are like, well, how do I know when I'm ready? And I always tell them like, you'll know because you're the one that does all the work. It's yeah. literally like, it's, it's very simple. Once you have it, it's like, oh yeah, my dog's reliable now. Like it's, it's like, I've had people where I told them your dog is great. They're off leash reliable, but they themselves were not ready for it. So then they wouldn't use it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you did a longer program, like a nine or 12 week program, we would make sure to cover all the commands, sit, stay, down, come, place, heal. Uh, we would definitely build recall to an off leash level and heal to an off leash level. Uh, and then typically, like if you do a nine week program by the seventh or, or eighth class, I'll tell you, you have everything that you need, go and practice and then come back when you hit a wall. Okay, so then you might be gone for like two months and then you come back like, hey, Jesse, this is where I'm at with my training. I don't know how to advance it. I have you show me what you're doing and then I go, okay, this is what you're missing or this is what you're doing incorrectly. These are the next steps. I help practice with you and then I go, go and practice some more. Yeah. Okay, so I've had clients that will train during the summer and then go to class seven. They'll take the fall and winter off to practice, 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 and then they'll come back in the spring, have like their eighth class and then go off and practice and then towards the end of the summer come back and have their final class and then i go great you know your dogs like they'll come and like utilize their office training whatever just to like make make sure that they're not doing anything wrong and i go yep your dog is good now okay, okay. so to get off leash stuff it's really just time the technically speaking the the um techniques that we use are off leash techniques it's just a matter of are you going to put in the time and repetition to build everything to an off leash level okay now with the way that i train uh, I call myself like the lazy man's dog trainer because you just train as you live your day with your dog. Okay. okay? There are going to be things like, for example, recall that do require effort. Yeah. You got to go to the park and like let your dog run around and stuff. But every time you walk your dog, you're training. Right. If you're working from home and you're like, I need you to sit still for a bit, you're doing place. Yeah. And now you're utilizing it. And place is easy. You just put the dog next to you. You have the leash there. You have your tools on and you're doing your work. And he's like, mom, I want to do something. And you go, no, we're not. You just press the button. And eventually you can build that to where you can be across the room from you because that button closes the gap. Yeah. It's a one mile range. Right. 
So you have plenty, you have communication no matter where your dog is at to go, don't do that or do that. Okay. So once you understand that you're literally just applying the training as you live your day and through the application of it is how you're building the reliability and the function of it. Okay. Because okay? most people train in a, in a controlled environment and then they hope one day it's going to work in an uncontrolled environment and then it doesn't yeah. because either the methods don't translate well uh, or the environment's so stimulating the dog doesn't care. Okay. Uh, other questions? So. Um, most common questions that we get yeah. is when does the e-collar go away? Okay. Uh, in my book, when you need it, it doesn't. So what that means is when you walk them, you'd have your collar on. Yeah. If he's going to be off leash, you'd have your collar on. If you're going to a restaurant, you'd have Where your collar the on. Supposed to sit? Like the on the neck. Little... So we usually uh, we do high up on the neck, on either side of the uh, the throat here. Like this. That's where like, the prongs go. Mm -hmm. The okay. two probes. Yeah. Yep. Either side like this. It's not okay. that you can't use the back, but dogs tend to be a little bit more sensitive up here. So right here, the, either of these pockets tend to work really well. Okay. okay? Um, the reason being for uh, when uh, when you're going to need it, you have it, is because you can't account for life. Right. Okay. Off-leash dogs, uh, random kids blowing up fireworks, stuff like that. Uh, it's not that you're always having to use it. Yeah. If you do the training as you were taught, the application always declines. At some point, it's simply just present. So in case you get caught off guard by something, um, you're not really using it. Maybe once in a blue moon, okay? Now, when people don't use the collar as I've taught them and they operate too low, they find themselves always having to use it because they're not using it in a way the dog wants to avoid. Does that make sense? So like um, running a red light is a $100 ticket, right? Imagine if it was a $1,000 ticket. I'm sure there'd be far less people wanting to run that red light, yeah. right? It's not worth the gamble of $1,000. So same thing for the dog. We want to find a consequence or like that line of communication where he goes, you know what? I don't like that. I want less of it. I want to avoid it. So when you're consistently operating at that level, now the application is less because the dog goes, I want, I don't want that. I don't want 80 to happen yeah. if that's his number. Okay. So the other thing is opportunistic behavior. You take the expressway, right? Uh, do you go to the speed limit? <laughs> Most people don't, right? <laughs> yeah, most people don't. And then you see a squad car, what happens? Right. And you get past the squad car, it's nice and clear what happens. Speed up. So that's called opportunistic behavior. So think of the e-collar as a cop on a collar. When it's present, your dog's gonna behave better. He understands there's threat of consequence, right? But then when you remove it, he's gonna behave his normal yeah. self, right? I've seen a lot of that in Bogey. Yeah. So now I do give you things that you can use to uh, correct things even when the collar is not on. Yeah. Uh, mainly uh, stuff in the house, you know, like barking out the window, or whatever. Okay. So if, if there's stuff that you're like, hey Jesse, when I take the collar off, you know, he's starting, he's learning, and I go, okay, this is what we're gonna do to correct that behavior. And as long as you're consistent with that, we should just also curb it even if you got the collar off. But if we're ever gonna be needing obedience type control, or even like behavioral type control, like when guests come over because he gets so overstimulated, yeah. you may need your tool there too. But then uh, the way it works in those contexts is different. Some people have the collar on and keep it on in that particular context, or they'll have it on the first 15 minutes. Once everything dies down, they'll remove the collar off the dog and the dog is fine. In other cases, some clients move past the collar and they can have guests come over and they don't need it all the time, okay? But definitely when you're outside in the world because you can't account for life, I always recommend that people have their collar on because random shit can happen, okay? Uh, so yeah, that's a super common thing that we get asked is when does it go away? Or like, when does my dog become a good dog? Uh, and I'll tell them that's not really a thing. Uh, dogs don't proactively choose like, oh, like, you know, I have a... Choose to do that. Exactly. I'm not, I'm not going to get hyped up at one o'clock today. Uh, your dog's being a good dog because you're being good about reinforcing consequence and, and, and communication and discipline and all that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Is it more beneficial to do the training like me just because of building trust between me and him? Oh, you already have trust. Yeah. It's, it's, um, he'll look to you more. Yeah. And because, uh, he doesn't understand that the, the collar is coming from you, but he can't understand that the, the collar is somewhat related to you. Okay. okay. So what we do make you more important to him because he starts to learn like, Hey, when I, when I, uh, like for example here, right. If I use the collar to, to, to correct this or yeah. tell him, I don't want you to do that. And then he comes over here and kind of more so focuses on you. He starts to learn like, hey, you know what? The more attentive I am to mom, the less that thing turns on. Okay. Like that he can relate. Uh, whether or not it builds trust, uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't think so. 
but you already have trust just because you live with them all the time. Yeah. You know, that's usually how it's built, just coexistence. Um, other questions? I think we covered everything because um, the most common one is when does it go away okay. um, and then of course like what kind of program should the, the person do yeah. so um, if you did a six week in person you know we would get heal we would get recall we'd get stationary control like place command uh, if you did like a two week board and train which is the equivalent again we cover sit stay down come place heal yeah. we cover everything so we cover more obedience um, we just have to transfer everything to you right. and you get, I believe it's two hours of follow up for every week we have the dog. Okay. So if you did a two week board and train, you get four hours of in-person follow up or four classes. Okay. And they can be used for anything. So you get your videos, you would watch your videos, yeah. you pick up your dog and I always recommend that clients, um, practice what they learn from the videos first. Okay. Don't worry about screwing up. And then usually by after a couple weeks, post the program. Uh, I would say now reach out to book a follow-up because then you're going to have questions. Yeah. Okay. So then I help you close the gap on those questions. The most common is, uh, command that people struggle with post a board and train is recall because yeah. it's, it's more technical. Uh, so I'll, I'll help review that with them or something that the board and train couldn't cover like guests coming over because we can't replicate that. Right. Um, so then you could use an in-home. The in-home doesn't just cover what the board and train covered. It can also cover what the board and train doesn't cover. Okay, it helps just kind of, once the dog understands the, the, the training, it's, it's very simple to just transfer to other things. Uh, but you could use your in-person follow-ups for other stuff that may have not been answered in the board and training stuff, okay? okay? And then you get a video for each week. The first week is always the longest. Yeah. It's about anywhere between an hour and a half to two hour and a two and a half hours long, because okay. I'm teaching everything, right. okay? The, if you did a two week program, the second video is like 30, maybe 45 minutes, because everything's been taught. I'm just now explaining to you how to start advancing what the dog knows okay, okay? Uh, and then you just watch those and then you just build from there okay with the in-person we cover less as well but you learn a lot more in terms of how the collar works how to use it yourself yeah. how to correct problems should they arise um, you get a lot more hands-on experience okay, okay? Uh, anything else That's it. Um, in terms of the booking process uh, if you decide to do a board and train, Tina would probably uh, send you over to uh, Maria or Elizabeth. Okay. They handle all the facility bookings. Tina yeah, is solely Maria my... Uh, yeah, okay. No worries. Oh, really? Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Um, yeah, Elizabeth reached out and sent an email. I think she was like out of town right now, but said there were available class if I was interested. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't, I feel undecided. I don't know what route to go. Okay. Um, well, bear in mind, if you're coming from Evanston, uh, for the in-persons, you're traveling here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now I, <laughs> yeah, so I do travel out, but it's expensive. I think, uh, if you're like out the city, like if it's a one-off class, we'll see what we can do. But if it's for each class, my it's an hourly my hourly rate per hour. Right. So if I'm gone, if I'm driving an hour there, an hour and back, an hour, uh, it's super expensive. Okay. Right. You're looking at like 600 plus just for one class right. because it pulls me from here because I'm back to back. Right. So if I'm gone for three hours, that's three clients that I could have right. had here in a row. Well, then I'm contrary to it's me coming here and back for the training sessions. Yeah. Repeatedly. So I don't oh, care what you do. Me. Yeah. <laughs> I be personally, I don't care what you do. Like if you're willing to pay for it, I show up. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the, so then the, the pro of the board and train is we get all the work done for you. Technically speaking, uh, we're still meeting here, but it's less, you know, you're not having sure. going week by I mean, week. I'm, I'm per perfectly willing to come. Here. Yeah. I mean, like coming here well, and we try to book people like when there's like less traffic, yeah. you know, if, if there's availability. Um, but yeah, it's uh, completely up to you. Your dog qualifies for either or. You can do a board and train or you can do an in-person program. If you want to learn more, I suggest be in-person. It is more time consuming for you just because you're coming from outside the city. Um, uh, up, up, up. And then... Uh, so after two weeks of the board and train, if he does do that, would you... Does he like graduate then or do you think do you call me and be like, we think he needs one more week? Does that ever happen? What's no, the, I, I've had that happen like maybe three times in my career. Okay. And the way I do it is I actually don't, um, 
if the owner did what I told them and I said, I suggest you do a three week board and train, we don't charge them. I actually keep the dog longer and I just say, I'm gonna start the program from here okay. because we had a lot of difficulty. So like for, to give you an example, we had a dog that was rescued from um, like Nicaragua or something. It was like, yeah, they found on the streets, it was a feral dog. Uh, Cause they were, it was her and her husband that were there for something and they lived there for a bit. And then they came up here with the dog. And in order to bring the dog, they had to get a trainer. Uh, and the dog freaked out with the prong collar. Like he would scream, like it sounded bad, okay? Fast forward a year or two, they're here in Chicago now. Dog is barking at everything, barking at people, barking at dogs, like it's constant. So then uh, they, uh, they were referred to us from a client. During the consultation, I told her, because you didn't work your dog through the prong collar, I'm gonna have to work the dog through it with the e-collar. Yeah. So just so you know, like it's not gonna be pretty. Uh, so we get the dog for the boarding train. Sure enough, I saw exactly what I saw, right? Um, they did what I instructed them to. Uh, I said, I think, I was like, we need at least two weeks for this dog. It turned out to be worse than I thought, okay? The dog was very resistant and very vocal. So, like, if you heard the dog screaming, you'd be like, I'm not going to Jesse because fucking, that sounds terrible, right? <laughs> but, but it's because the dog was a feral dog. Yeah. So then I told her, I want to keep her dog an additional week because he's now just making progress yeah. and I'm not happy with it, but I'm not going to charge you for it, okay. right? So then she's like, well, can you send me, send me what you have? So I sent it to her and she's like, oh my God, like this is terrible, this and that. I'm like, this is exactly what you told me about. Yeah. And I told you in the consultation, this is what we're gonna deal with, right. right? So then I told her, just pick your dog up, leave, because I'm not gonna deal with you. Because again, it's not the dog. Right. I'll make progress with the dog, it's the human. So if, the, if I say do at least two weeks and you do it and I have an issue, I will keep the dog a little bit longer. I don't charge you, okay? okay? Now, if I say do three weeks and you book two weeks, now I say, okay, well, I recommended this yeah. and now we have to do this. And now you're gonna have to pay for the extra, blah, 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 okay? okay. Uh, I'm pretty, so I, when I first started training, I was $120 an hour, $25 an hour, I'm super cheap. Uh, if I didn't get results for your dog that class, I didn't charge you. I would just come back and yeah. do it again. And I continue that now, but now because I, I did all my work in the beginning, I, there's no dog, again, that I can't train. Okay. It's the human. It's the human that I'm gonna have issues well, with. <laughs> I don't think your dog's gonna be a problem. I do think his number may be a little bit higher because he's a power breed. He's a strong boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but I have had, for example, I can have two Rottweilers, both 150 pounds, yeah. okay. and one is like 85. Jesus. I know, you're getting strong, it's okay. One at 85, and then one could be at 15. They could have two completely different numbers. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna just pull here. One sec. Then relax. Yep. Wait a sec. It's okay. Wait a sec. Oh my it's okay. Wait a sec. This is just the boxer. <laughs> yep. This is what they all do? Somewhat. It's okay. One sec. Get out. Yeah, so your collar is. Yeah, I need a, bit, a smaller one. So all that spinning is a tantrum because uh -huh. he doesn't want to settle. We're going to do this. This needs to be at least. So clip this to his, uh, his flat collar. There you go. This needs to be yours Perfect. there you go okay so that he should not slip out of so when you're pulling up what you're telling him is you need to relax yeah. and then once he relaxes you relax okay. so now you exactly right so with boxers you saw that spinning jump yeah. they do that shit all the time <laughs> so Reassuring. He's not <laughs> no 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 i have seen at this point in my career everything under the sun yeah. it's very very rare they get thrown for a loop and also, too, again, like he didn't come home until eight months, so I don't know what Doesn't was matter. done before then. I have no idea, really. He, I know he was with a family or a couple or something, but mm. they had to surrender him because they were sick. Yeah. All that stuff doesn't matter. 
Yeah. It's all about the present because dogs don't think about like, oh, the first eight months of my life was so difficult, you know? He's just like, okay, I'm with a new person. Yeah. So if I had your dog within like two days, he'd be a completely different dog because I, I'm a trainer, I know what I'm doing and yeah. I'm gonna correct things from the get-go. So then he thinks, oh, I'm with Jesse now and when I do this, he corrects me. When I do this, he corrects me from day one. Yeah. The only thing that we would have to do is work against the current relationship structure because he's used to being a certain way with you. Right. So like right now, cause he's used to getting his way and then I came in and I said, you're not gonna do that. Yeah. And he started to spin and then he started to escalate, right? Cause he's going, wait a minute, this has never happened yeah. before, right? So that's what we'd have to work against, but it's not gonna be bad, okay? okay? But you have to push, the, again, that's why I always say it's the human. Yeah. I'm not worried about your dog. This to me is easy, okay? okay? Uh, did you watch any of our training videos? I, you know, Zach and Dan, I think, might have sent me some. I don't, I haven't they seen probably them. sent you bogeys yeah. or something, yeah. Well, I'll, if they didn't, I'll ask them and I'll yeah. uh, watch a couple. You can also see um, our, like, I didn't do those videos. I think Enrique trained him. Yes. Um, and I think Bogey did the board and train as well. I think he did he it did. two weeks. He did. Yeah. As a pop thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> on my website, caninperspective.com, yeah. uh, if you go on the homepage and just go up a little bit, you'll see a, a video of like a pit bull smiling in the sun. Okay. That's a great video. It's a behavioral video, yeah. but I explain the process. So I use footage from the video, but then I stop and explain it and I use more footage. So that it just kind of gives you a concept instead of like watching an hour of raw, like it's like, um, it can get boring. Right. <laughs> okay. But with this one, it's like, okay, here's some clips. Here's an explanation. Here's some more examples, more explanation. Okay. Uh, otherwise it's really just down to you deciding what you want to do. Okay. And then uh, whether it's the in-person or the board and train, yeah. okay? Now at the in-person, if you do want to take advantage of the weather, you'd want to try to get in sooner right. rather than later. Right. Because uh, once it gets too cold, I start training out of my facility located in the West Loop. And uh, I think, because for you, it's just down Lake Shore, so it's much more straightforward for you to come here as opposed to like trying to go down West yeah. from where you're at, okay? okay. Anything else? I don't think so. Okay. I, when should I decide? Bye. When like, you're ready. Okay. <laughs> there's, there's, there's no rush on my end. Yeah. You know, but I do have, like, I have three other consults today, and it's just first come, first serve. So then um, if, like, Saturday's your best day to uh, that you're available or whatever, um, you know, if they come in, they have their consult, and they right away they book it, then my day, my Saturday can get booked up, and yeah. it just pushes you out. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it's it's completely up to you. Um, and what if, I, what if I do do the in-person and let's say I'm out of town for a week and I doesn't can't matter. Saturday, is there a, can I come a different time? Just push it back. Okay. Usually what I'll do is, because sometimes, like let's say you're on, you're on a Saturday, you're out of town, you come back on a Friday, and then your class is Saturday, yeah. I'll tell you you don't have the class. I was like, just push out another week because you're only there for like half a day. It, it's a waste of a class, to be honest, yeah. right? So it's flexible as long as we know ahead of time. And all it, all it impacts is your, is your priority. So let's say, Let's say Saturday at 11 was available and you booked it next Saturday yeah. and you started right away. But then uh, you were out of town for three weeks, right? So you would have priority over 11 o'clock on Saturday for six weeks plus one, so seven weeks. You're just losing three of those priority days. Okay. So come the seventh day, you might only have had four classes with two left over, but then Tina would reach out and say, hey, you know, I had to book 11 o'clock because Saturday's a really busy day because uh, you used up your priority, what's your other availability? And then we would just finish the classes at a different time. Okay. And how long are the classes? An hour. They are an hour. Yeah. Okay. And then we have a 48 hour uh, window for cancellation. Okay. So if you cancel outside of 48 hours, no big deal. Cause it's really hard to uh, move people around and fill gaps. So two days gives us enough time, yeah. but sometimes like we can't fill it. And then I'm just stuck here for an hour with nothing to do. Uh, if you cancel five hours before your program or before your class, it just counts as a class. And we do give everybody one last minute cancellation. So if you cancel like the day before, it's not a big deal. Like you get that freebie cancellation, but if it happens a second time, the second one would count against, would count as a class because we're not gonna be able to fill it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, otherwise, if you give us plenty of heads up, not a problem. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Um, no, I think that's it. Yep. Let's so, you know, just take a look, see what worked best for you yeah. in terms of where you're coming from. Um, and then if you, if you want to,